And now we're going to have John Bootsma, who is one of the lead pastors of this campus, come up and preach. He is an amazing boss and a really amazing man of God. Thank you, Linda. It's good to always throw that in there, right? <laughs> so I know. Okay. Well, it's good to be with you all tonight. And uh, boy, it's winter time, isn't it? We finally got some snow. Isn't that great? Nice cold weather. I got to see somebody over there is ready for the summer already. Anyway, it's, uh, it's a privilege to, to be here with you tonight. I just want to open up with prayer again. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for just the honor and privilege we have to be here tonight to worship together publicly, corporately. Father, in a, in a nation where things are free to worship, where we have a freedom of religion, where, Lord, we can, we can come before you. Thank you for each man and woman that is in this place tonight. We ask that you'd encounter our hearts with your glory, with your love. Lord, that you'd break in and do something very profound and new deep within our, our lives, Lord, to transform us and to, to enable us to encounter your heart and your love in many ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this year, 2016, we are focusing as our major theme, uh, living like Jesus. And so we don't fully know what that looks like, but we're growing in it and we're learning what it is more and more and more. And one thing that I've recognized is that if we're going to live like anybody, uh, it always helps to learn to think like them. And so to live like Jesus, it's good to think like Jesus. And there's many different attributes of what it is to uh, to be like him or to, to live like him. Uh, there's the external life, there's the internal life, you know, the hidden life. And tonight I want to focus mostly on the hidden life of Jesus. And, uh, you know, just some of the things that he did when he was out of the spotlight. You know, we can, maybe most of us don't spend a lot of time in the spotlight, I'm not sure, but we're always in the place where, you know, we're either all by ourselves or we're out in the place where we're in the public eye. And when in the public eye, it could be that the lights are blazing, you know, there could be applause or maybe there's not applause, you know, it could be there's crowds there. But what are you like uh, when there's nobody there looking at you, where there's nobody there, you know, accolading your performance and telling you how great you are or what a, what a wonderful job you've done? What are you like when it's just you and God? What are you like when it's just you and your family? And, uh, and in, in considering that, we're beginning to consider what it is to engage really our hidden life. I like to look at it too as, as um, when we're in the, when we're in, you know, when we're in a doing mode. For those of us that are employed, we often have a to-do list, right? Who has to-do lists? Who's got jobs where they got a lot of stuff you got to get done? <clears throat> and when we're in that position, you're do, do, do all the time. But hopefully, over the course of a 24-hour period, that breaks off and, and you get into a place and a point in time where you've actually got a degree of freedom. You've got a, a point where you maybe have some, some flex time or you've got some disposable time. And the question I want to ask you, even in light of Jesus' life, is what do you do with your flex time? You can call it your proactive time versus your reactive time. Because when we're when we got a job, there's things that we have to get done. Sometimes we react or we respond, but there's requirements of us and we, and we got to work. We got to do things. But when that pressure is not on, when you've got some, you know, some disposable time, how do you spend it? What do you do in those times? What are you like when there is, you know, nobody looking or when it's just you and your family? Uh, I, I remember looking at John Arnott years ago and I thought, you know, John is an extremely unusual man. Because John seems to be exactly the same in the public eye as he is in the private. You know, as he is kind of behind the scenes when it's just one or two people. And that inspired me because I thought, you know, I want to be the same person. In the book of Psalms, it says, Lord, unite my heart to fear your name. And I think part of that means, you know, help me to, to just be united in spirit, united in heart so that I'm not you know, different people based upon where I am. You know, that you look this way for these people and that way for other people. And, and uh, so on. And so, in Jesus' life, I, I feel very inspired by looking at what life was like for him before the public eye was on him for about three and a half years. Now, even during that three and a half year period, we see what things are like when the crowds are gone, when the applause has died down, when there's nobody really there, because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give us a bit of a description into his life. And tonight, I want to focus mostly on the book of, uh, of Luke and, and just take a look at, at what life was like for Jesus 
uh, during that point in time. But, uh, but understand that, you know, in the disposable time with Jesus, one thing that I learned to appreciate is, is that, yes, I'm, you know, I know he slept because he would sleep in the boat, for example. You know, when the waves were getting really rocky, that's when he slept. But we're, we're going to see that many times he was in a place where he would get up to the mountain to be in a place of prayer, to be in the place of the presence of God. And so what's it like for you? When, when you're in, in that place where you've got free time, uh, when you, uh, you dig in to, you know, some freedom, what, what do you do with your life? Do you sit in front of the, you know, the boob tube, get a nice seat and flick the channels and see what's going on? Because the, the message in Jesus' life is that there's no way he could give away what he didn't first have. And you and I can't give away what we don't carry. And if you don't take your your proactive time, if I could put it that way, if you don't take your disposable time and start to cultivate something, start to put something inside of you, when the time comes to release the glory of God or to release the kingdom or to declare the love of Jesus and to demonstrate it, you may find that there's nothing there. How many know what I'm talking about? There's times where I've laid hands on the sick and nothing's happened. And I'm thinking, okay, God, why is that? You know, is it lack of faith? Maybe it's, maybe it's in part because... There needs to be a bit of a greater level of cultivating the presence or the anointing or the authority so that when I do lay hands on the sick, there is something to be given away. And so the outward life is, is, um, is a visible life, but the inward cultivation tends to be very hidden. And the external life is that which is the overflow of what's, what's inside of you. And so let's look a little bit at Jesus' life, because if we're going to live like Jesus, we would do well to examine his life a little bit. And so... We noticed in Luke chapter 2 um, a little bit about Jesus' life because we really didn't find out too much about him. You know, after his birth when he was just a young baby, there's not a lot that's spoken about him. But we do know that prophetically the Lord spoke to his mother Mary, also spoke to Joseph. Uh, you know, Mary would have told Joseph, and they knew that there was a lot of unusual circumstances in his life. But suddenly, you know, the, the, the scriptures start telling us when he was 12 years old, and his family went up to Jerusalem at that point in time for the Feast of Passover. And because things happen in big families, and they travel in caravans after the Feast of Passover, they're ready to come back home again. And Mary, assuming that her son was with her somewhere, didn't pay a lot of attention. But after about a day or so, it's like they hadn't seen young Jesus. It's like, where are you, Jesus? And discovering that he is not in their midst, they go back to Jerusalem. And it says, after the third day, uh, in verse 46 of Luke 2, after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And so that's the first point. There is a reality where Jesus... I believe understanding, you know, having a grasp of who he was and what he was called to do because his response was to his mother, you know, who he thought maybe got her pantyhose in a knot or something, says, Mom, you know, calm down. I'm sure he didn't say it that way. He was very honoring. But it's like, you know, didn't you know that I had to be about my father's business? Where there's an element of surprise in Jesus' life. And yet he, understanding the calling that was on his life, understanding what would be required of him, took time when life was still secret, when the people weren't coming at him, weren't pressing in to touch him, as happened about 18 or 19 and 20 years later. He took the time to really cultivate a deep inner life with his Father in heaven. Now, I'd like to suggest to you that we would, you know, it would behoove us to do the same. Because I don't know what your tomorrow will look like, but I can tell you what your tomorrow will look like when you tell me what your today looks like. Are you with me? If I can see your habits today, I will begin to get a sense of what your life will look like tomorrow and next week, next month, next year. And if I see you digging deep into the, into the place of the presence of God, cultivating his presence, digging deep into his word, asking for revelation, finding yourself in groups where you can ask questions, where you can dialogue about what the word is stating, and actually even going out and volunteering and offering to pray for the sick or, you know, trusting God, maybe practicing walking on water. I don't know. You know, people do that, right? Walking through walls. I heard about people that were practicing walking through walls, and they did it once. So I, don't, I didn't witness it, but I heard they did it, right? But, you know, we have a destiny that one day we're going to have resurrection bodies. And so when the scripture says, pray your kingdom come, your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven, 
Well, that's the kingdom coming now. It's the kingdom coming in advance of that particular time. And so the point in the midst of this is, what are you doing with your life today? And it's going to be hard for you to do much other than just entertain yourself if you don't have a sense of vision as to where you're going. And I believe that Jesus is our model for all things, meaning that Jesus, is, Jesus lived a life that was meant to be the life of the typical ordinary Christian, son or daughter of the Most High. And so that's the model, that's the standard, that's the benchmark. And if that's the benchmark, we would do well to begin to look at how he cultivated his inner life and his personal life so that we could begin to do the things that he did on the external. And so Jesus asked a lot of questions. He, you know, he, he took time to be with them. And so as we, as we continue on with Jesus, we begin to see that uh, in that same passage of Luke chapter 2, that because of his choices, because of his actions, his responses, he increased, Scripture says, in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. Now, I like favor. <laughs> I really like favor. How many do you do? Yeah. Favor is great. I, I don't think the world has a word. I don't think they really understand favor. It's one of those nebulous things where things just go right for you. I have a daughter that just seems like has unusual favor. And I have several daughters that I think have great favor and kids, but I have one that just seems to be at the top of the heap with favor. Things just go right for her no matter what. And it just seems like there's a favor of God. I think Tim Tebow in the football world had a, had a favor on him. It's just favor. I mean, you know, they'd say he's not the best quarterback out there, but he just seems to win the games. Right? And, and Jesus grew in stature and wisdom and in favor with both God and men. I like having favor with men. It's a good thing. It's a lot better than not having favor with men. And yet, how did that happen? I believe it happened because he began to cultivate an inner life and a hidden life and took the time in his disposable time to make sure that he was affecting change or he was, be he was beginning to impart into his inner man and into his spirit the things that would be necessary in his life for the times that were to come. And so you and I could do the same. Now let's continue to look at what Jesus' life was like. Looking at Luke chapter 5, verse 15. You know, furthermore, you know, snapshot from the book of Luke. But it says, however, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So we're fast forwarding more than 18 years from when he was 12. And so I can only assume that in that 30 year period, apart from being a carpenter, apart from being the apprentice by, jo by Joseph's side, he took a lot of time to really develop and to cultivate that hidden life. It doesn't tell us much, but I would assume that the things that he practiced with his disposable time, because do you know what I'm saying with being reactive and being proactive? I mean, there's a lot of time that I find myself spending and being reactive. You know, pressures come, there's a demand, the tyranny of the urgent begins to happen. And I don't think it's a bad thing, but I think it needs to be, you know, it, it needs to be managed. Jesus himself did a lot of his miracles when he was interrupted. He did a majority of them. He was interrupted and he stopped. He, he didn't necessarily go up and ask people, do you want to be healed, by the way? They came to him. And so in doing that, I, I recognize that a lot of my reactive time could be the hand of God just breaking into my life saying, John, I want to, I want to see my kingdom come right now in your life and in the lives of those that surround you. And so we want to make room for that to take place. But when the crowds have dismissed, when nobody's around, and by the way, in Jesus' life, they crowded around him, like in Capernaum. They were there touching him and crowding around him where even when he was in the, in the house, you know, where the, the men come, the four men carrying somebody on a stretcher, and they have to tear the roof off and let him down through the, through the ceiling because the crowds were that big. I don't really want to know what that's like. I wouldn't want to be that person, but... You know, I would love to see a whole church like that, and I'd be part of them. Okay, I don't want to be the only one, but I'd like to be part of a great army where suddenly, you know, there's so much anointing, so much authority, so much power, signs and wonders and miracles taking place that, you know, they, you know medicine hits the wall, but they come to us because there's an anointing on us. There's something different about you, and his name is Jesus, and he's Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
And so they came to Jesus to be healed, and they came to hear because his teaching was of great authority. And then it says in verse 16 of Luke 5, so he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. And thus, I would say, is the secret to really cultivating a life of living like Jesus. As Jesus went into the wilderness, he prayed. He went and he, he hid himself. He talks in some of his parables about you, when you pray, go into your closet. And so I want to ask you, what's your prayer life like? Do you have dreams and visions of something that's really wonderful and grandeur, or want, something that you feel is of the Lord, something that, that stirs in your heart, something you dream about at night and you wake up thinking about? By the way, I applaud and I fully validate a ministry that doesn't necessarily take place on the church mountain. By that, I validate a ministry that takes place in the business or the commerce mountain, that takes place in medicine or in education or in commerce, you know, commerce we've already talked about, Talk, takes place in arts and technology and science and medicine and, you know, so on and so forth. I think God is there. The idea is to see the kingdom released wherever you are. But you still will have disposable time. If you're in a computer science, you may spend a lot of time in your computer science books being the best you can be at computer science. But there's computer science problems out there right now that the Lord can give you the blueprints for to solve those problems to raise you to the top of the mountain so that you can really release the glory of God. That you have not, it may not be signs and wonders as you lay hands on the sick, although it might be, but it could be signs and wonders as instead of healing bodies, you're healing structures or you're healing systems that are broken. We need people right now to heal the economy. Amen? You know, in Canada, the United States, globally, we need people to lay hands on the economy that have understanding to release it. But I don't think that's going to happen with somebody that doesn't have an inner life that is deep in the place of prayer, that is seeking the Lord for the solutions to the problems that we face today. And so Jesus often withdrew into the wilderness and he prayed. It's not a one-off thing. It's a lifestyle. Luke 6 verse 12, it says, It came to pass in those days that he went up to the mountain to pray. He continued all night in prayer to God. And so, you know, we here at Catch the Fire have one night a month where we have an open public prayer meeting. It doesn't have to be an open public prayer meeting. They're great, you know, they're great, but you can spend time praying at home. You can be in a place where you're up in the middle of the night and seek the Lord. I encourage you, if you wake up in the night, don't batter your brains thinking about why you're awake. Use the time to be in the place of prayer. Get into the heart of God. Get into his face and begin to declare the things that he gives you. If you don't know what, what to pray, get the scriptures and pray the scriptures. Pray for your friends. Pray for your prayer lists. Begin to pray for your job. Pray for yourself. Pray for others. Even Job in Job 42 verse 10 says the Lord restored to Job double when he prayed for his friends. So begin to develop a prayer list. Now we're going to talk more about the why of prayer, but I want to press into this a little bit more. You know, prayer... Prayer will lead to action in response. Further on in Luke chapter 6 and verse 13, so right after Jesus spent all night in prayer, it says, when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. And from them, so he had a multitude of disciples, and from that multitude, he just picked a few. He says he chose 12, whom he also named apostles. And then you know, a few verses later, it says, Judas Iscariot was one of them who also became a traitor. Now, it's fascinating. In the place of prayer, I believe the Lord gave him Judas. I believe the Lord told him in the place of prayer that Judas would betray him. Because it was the heart of the Father. It was the Father's will. You know, sometimes he's not just interested in your, you know, in your comfort and in your ease and in your outward success. He's, he's more interested in your heart and your transformation and sanctification. And sometimes, you know, having a trader on board might just help speed the process up. I'm not suggesting you hire traders, but what I'm suggesting is, is that you're open to being led by the Spirit of God. And in Jesus' case, uh, he, he, he hired, you know, he brought a Judas on board with him, but it came from the place of prayer. Further on in Luke 17, it says he came down with them. He stood in a level place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude from all Judea, 
Jerusalem from the sea coast of Tyre Sidon who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. Now, I would suggest that power comes out from you because you're in the place of the presence. It's like, why do we fast? Maybe you say, I don't fast. <laughs> it's okay, maybe we will fast. Why should we fast? All right, it doesn't, I find that when I fast, it doesn't go fast. All right, well, fasting is not twisting God's arm to give him something he doesn't want to. Okay, fasting positions you close to the throne of God so that your, your flesh and your soul have to submit to your spirit that is yielded to the Holy Spirit, and you take your cold heart and you place it next to the hot fire of His love by the throne of His grace, and I think it just rubs off on you. There's this place of favor. There's something where darkness is repelled and pushed back. And in the place of being close, you begin to bring your supplications and your prayers before His throne of grace to find grace in your time of need. And so when we pray, we've got this two-way connection to the one who first looked for you, who first sought you out so that he could have a place of intimacy with you. And so, and in that place, I believe there's anointing that rubs off. There's authority that rubs off. And in the place of digging deep in the scriptures, there's revelation and understanding. What's revelation? I believe revelation is where there's things that are there, but they just seem dark or veiled, and he just lifts the veil. It's, it's where the penny drops. It's, aha. Wow, I see it now. And suddenly the revelation comes and revelation begins to transform your heart and life and give you direction and give you focus. And so, you know, Jesus went on and, and uh, you know, he, he, he spoke the word, he declared it, he demonstrated it, he had authority, he had anointing. Many people came after him. And so he, he continued to teach them. Now, Further on Jesus' value in prayer, Luke chapter 19 tells a story of Jesus overlooking Jerusalem, weeping. And by the way, I think weeping is a legitimate form of prayer. I think intercession, where you begin to weep and you cry out, sometimes it's, it's the groans of the Holy Spirit that are too deep for words, where you just cry before God because it seems to be too big. I believe the Lord delights in putting you in situations that are too great for you. It's too much for you. I, I, I don't think I can handle that, God. It's like, well, precisely. That's why you come to me, because I can handle it. You know, and then we begin to ask, and we find strength, we find grace to help in your time of need. You know what grace is? Grace is the divine enablement of God. It's that supernatural strength of the Holy Spirit that infuses us, that fills us to enable us to do something that without that grace we wouldn't be able to do. And so we begin to step into his heart. But here in Luke 19, he's weeping over Jerusalem because he sees what's about to befall Jerusalem in, you know, just 40 years or so. And less than that, what was about to come on her. And, and it says, after that, what did he do? After he weeps, it says in verse 45 of Luke 19, then he went into the temple and he began to drive out those who bought and sold in and saying to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Why would he do that? I believe in the place of prayer when he's overlooking the, the holy city, the city that he knew was, was meant, was ordained to be the capital city from which he would rule the earth even in the age to come, the city that even now was holy to the Lord. He looked and he thought, you've made it a den of thieves, and no wonder that you, don't, you have no idea what's happening 40 years, just four decades down the road. You have no idea what's about to happen, but if you would be a people of prayer, if you would read the scriptures and believe it, and were the religious leaders of the day, just led them astray the whole way. If you would be in a place of prayer, you could actually withhold, you could hold that whole devastation of AD 70 back. He says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. God has ordained that we as people begin to govern our world, govern our lives govern our sphere of authority, but ultimately the world around us by prayer. Prayer is you releasing your gov governmental authority and anointing in the sphere of influence around you. And prayer is a two-way conversation with God, but ultimately it's about what do you want, Lord? Jesus himself 
You know, at the cross, before the cross, he's in a place of prayer. He's in a place of deep agony where even Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, I think, 8, 9, 10, it says that, you know, the deep agony of soul, you know, where he, he, he sweat blood and he's saying, but Lord, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Because prayer is the place where we say, Father, what do you want to do here? And when we hear what he wants to do, we declare it back to him. And at, at the spoken word, at the declaration of those of us that are on the earth, God begins to move. He moves at the sound of your voice. He moves when you speak. He wants to hear you talk. But the talking that he wants to hear is that which is in agreement with him. It's not that which is in agreement with darkness or that which is filled with doubt. And so... He said, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. And so it was tragic. Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. He taught them through demonstration. It says that in uh, Luke chapter 9, he took Peter, James, and John up to the mountain and prayed. And as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white. I love it that when Jesus prays, something just happens. You know, and you might think, well, that's Jesus. You know, that's, that's Jesus. That's... And then how many of you would say, well, that's not going to happen to me. Well, don't say that. Or you make it a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, your words are powerful. If I could recommend to you Derek Prince's book, it's an old book, but it's blessing or curse. You choose. You can bless yourself by agreeing with God, or you can curse yourself by agreeing with the enemy. It's your choice. But let me give you some counsel. Agree with God. And use your words to agree with God. And I mean, even in the little things, how many of you have ever said, well, you know, I'll probably just choose the longest line in the supermarket anyway. And then you do. Well, I'll never find a parking spot. You know. <laughs> well, then you won't. Because the enemy wants to rally in on those words that you speak. And so, and as Jesus, as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered. And it says, a cloud came and overshadowed them. And they were fearful as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Hear him. Now, there's a lot of things we can learn from Jesus. But again, you know, the outside is, is really simply a result of what's inside. And he cultivated a hidden life. And the same thing with you. What do you do with your hidden life? What are you cultivating with that? And so by the end of chapter 9, Jesus was telling his disciples to follow him and to go preach the kingdom of heaven in their midst. By Luke 10, he appointed 70 others and he sent them out two by two into every place that he was to go. And he said, the harvest is great, the laborers are few. Pray, therefore, that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers into the harvest field. It's one of the few times that Jesus specifically told us what to pray for. I think there's a number of reasons why he told us to pray for that. One of them is because if we don't pray it, we're not going to get a lot of laborers. It's just more work for the rest of us. How many of you want more work to do? It's maybe just the least of it. You know, it's my flesh crying out, saying, God, we need more help. But, you know, it's all part and parcel. So therefore, pray. And then he goes, by the way, I'm going to send you out like lambs among wolves. And don't take a money bag or a knapsack or any sandals, by the way. And don't greet anyone on the road. And he says, by the way, also heal the sick and uh, say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. So do you know why you need to pray? See, Jesus will give you something to do that is beyond yourself. And so when we pray, prayer is an invitation to release the glory of God. Living like Jesus, Jesus prayed. Acts chapter 10, 38 makes it clear that you know, he was a man filled with the Holy Spirit. He gave up his divinity. So yes, he was still fully God, but he's given that up. And so I, I want to celebrate the divinity of God. I also want to celebrate the humanity of God. He humbled himself according to Philippians chapter 2. He took on the image of a man and he humbled himself even like a servant and became obedient unto death. And therefore, the Father has given him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so he gives them these impossible things to do that they'd never done before. So no wonder they're going to pray. And what's their response in Luke chapter 11, verse 1? Lord, teach us to pray. Because they see Jesus praying. They're realizing we don't have what it takes. God, teach us to pray. Can I make a statement here to you? 
This is voluntary. You don't have to do it. As a matter of fact, you don't have to get saved. You don't have to worship. Not, not right now. You don't have to worship. You will worship. One day, I believe you're all here because you want to be. Anybody get dragged here tonight? Right. I trust you're here because you want to be. But, you know, in the end, you will pray. You, you, I, I believe the circumstances and the situations that surround us will bring us to the point where our prayer life will increase. And I, and I believe you. Yeah, I believe there's a good number of people out there that are probably disillusioned and disappointed with prayer. You've had disappointments. And I want to minister into that tonight. We're going to have seven, I think we've got seven ministry team that are available for that. And I think that needs to be a focus. It's like, God, help me when it comes to my prayer life. Lord, I confess my disillusionment. I confess my disappointment. I confess that I, I prayed and didn't happen the way I wanted. And I thought, is it real anyway? And we're going to dig into that a little bit more. But... But Jesus, you know, then begins to teach them the Lord's Prayer and teaches them how to pray. He's pressing on in the book of Luke to chapter 11. He says, uh, sorry, this is actually right after the Lord's Prayer. Luke 11, verse 5, he says, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, give me three loaves, for a friend of mine is come on a journey. I've got nothing to feed him. And he's going to answer him and say, Don't trouble me, for my door is shut. My children are with me in bed. I can't rise and give it to you. I say to you, though, he won't rise and give it to you because you're his friend, but because of your persistence, he will rise and give you as much bread as you need. There's a secret there. It's also listed in Luke chapter 18. There is something about persistence in prayer. I want to urge you. Press in in the place of prayer. Jesus is giving us permission and authorizations through the scripture to press in in prayer. Don't feel like you have to be super polite and say, well, I, I asked you once, and so you know what's on my heart, God. Press in, press in. I don't understand it all. God knows what we need, but if, you know, if God is sovereign, then why pray at all, right? If God's sovereign, wants to do whatever he wants? I'm going to answer that question in just a bit, by the way. Have you ever thought of that? You know, if God's sovereign, if he's going to do whatever he wants anyway, then why pray? Think about that for a sec. So we're going to keep going. Jesus teaches to pray. He says, press in in persistence because the man's going to give him the three. It's, it's, as though, it's as though by you pressing into the heart of God that God is, you know, just, all right, I'll give it to you. You know, it's, it's as though you're bothering him, which I don't believe you are. But it's almost like that's what the picture is presenting. But Jesus goes on in verse 9, and he says, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. You know, it's, it's, it's simple. Ask, it will be given to you. It's on your cards. If you got your Connect card tonight, I want to encourage you to take your card that you received when it's in your bulletin. I think it's there, right? And it says, ask, and it will be given to you. There's a journaling question there. There's... You know, the context there, read it, take it home with you, fill out a praise report or prayer request, drop it off afterwards for us, but ask. It'll be given to you. Seek and you will find. That's like a, a bit of a deeper asking. Knock and it'll be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. And then he goes on and says, if a man asks for bread from a father, any father among you, is he going to give him a stone? If he asks for fish, will he give him a serpent? You know, or a fish, if he asks for an egg, is he going to give him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You know, press in, ask. You know, if you don't know what to ask, I mean, I'm sure, anybody not know what to ask for? <laughs> we probably all have lots of prayer requests. But ask. He's inviting you to ask. Start with this. If you're coming before the throne of grace, Take that passage and pray it back to him. Say, Father, you've, asked, you've invited me to ask, to seek, and to knock. And I have a need. And I'm going to learn to persist. And I'm going to press into your presence. And I'm not going to give you any rest until this thing is answered. I have seen answered prayer. I've seen it in my own life. I pressed, even when I didn't really feel a lot of hope, I pressed in. And God broke in. You know, he's broken in in different ways in the midst of it. And so, verse 8, he ends in Luke 18, 8. I tell you, he'll avenge them speedily. Because the whole issue, by the way, the whole context is an end times context. It's the end of the age where there's tons of injustice. Are you prepared for that? 
If we think there's injustice now, just wait a few years. Sorry to say, but watch what's going to happen on the injustice scale. But God gives you a solution now. Develop your cultivate. Cultivate that deep hidden life so that you learn how to press in because God promises in Luke 18, 8 that he will avenge you speedily. But nevertheless, will God find faith? Will the Son of Man find faith on the earth when he comes? If you don't pray now, what does that say about your faith? Any answers? I mean, we're not going to do a show of hands, but I'd be interested to know how many people here pray an hour a week or half an hour a week. You know, if we're not praying now, if we have no faith that our prayers are going to be answered now, what does that say about our faith? Just ask him. And so, continues on here and. You know, he talks about the Pharisee and the tax collector, both praying. And he gives a key. He says, be like the tax collector who's humble, comes before God humbly. He knows he's a mess. He knows he's done a lot of wrong, but he comes humbly before his throne of grace. Jesus says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. There's a key to your prayer life. Do you have any pride in your life? Good. I heard a few no's out there. That's great news. I can tell you, it, there, some people say there's no formulas in the Scripture. No, there's one right here. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. It's like, God, we put on the mantle of humility. How many want the mantle of humility on? Stretch your arms out. Say, Lord, put on us that mantle of humility. God, we want to be cloaked with humility that attracts the grace of God, that enables us to push through and press on in the midst of challenging times. Lord, we want you. Help us to be humble before your throne of grace. You know, there's circumstances in life where we just need to ask for the grace package. You know, I, I believe there's a package of grace. We had my daughter, Gabrielle, and uh, her husband, Benji, um, got married just this past May. But one of the a piece of counsel that was given to Gabrielle in light of her husband was, Gabrielle, you need to really press in before you say yes to this man, you need to press in for the grace package because there's a call on his life to the Hispanic world. His name is Benji Nunez. He's actually going to speak here in May. Uh, he's been invited up by the Spanish community or the Hispanic community. But, you know, who knows what's going to happen down the road. He could end up in the Hispanic world and, you know, there's a lot of cartels. There's a lot of stuff out there. But, you know, she didn't really picture herself growing up that she was going to marry a Hispanic. And we love the Hispanics, by the way. Good to see the Alvarezes here. <laughs> But, you know, it just wasn't, wasn't on her radar. She had nothing against anybody, but just wasn't on her radar. And it's like, you got to realize what, what I'm inviting you to do. Because it seemed like the Lord was steering her in this direction very strongly and saying, this is my number one choice for you, Gabrielle. It's up to you if you want to lead it. But before she could say yes, it was also a thing of laying down her own, her own calling, her own skills. She, she's probably, she carries a great deal of excellence her whole life growing up. She was just excellent at whatever she did. She's an excellent athlete, excellent speaker, musician. You know, a lot of things she just did with great excellence. And, and yet for her, it was like, Gabriel, you need a grace package to lay down your life to serve this man and the calling that I've got in his life. And you need to dig deep for it now. And if you can't get that grace package, I encourage you not to say yes on the marriage proposal. Because we need grace. His grace is sufficient for us. But, you know, it's much better to to obtain grace before you say yes to something. Would you agree? You know, it's like the same thing, honestly, I think is, is when it comes to death. I mean, there will, according to Scripture, be a number of martyrs down the road. And I think before we get into a situation where, where we know we could be martyred, we need to press into the heart of God and get the grace package to say, God, if it's, if it's unto death, you know, we overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, and they loved not their life to the death. You know, there's, some of us are going to need a, a grace package for martyrdom. Now, that's an extreme. But, you know, if you're not willing to, to live for something, you won't be willing to die for it. And so what do you need a grace package for? And so you get that through the place of prayer, digging deep and saying, you know, yes, God. And so Jesus needed a grace package when he was about to face the cross. And he went to the cross and, and he's saying, you know, he had his disciples with them and told them to, to pray that they wouldn't enter into temptation. He says, disciples, pray, because there's temptation right at your door. you got to pray. 
you know, what, what, do you, what, what do you think the solution is to temptation? Jesus thought it was a, a prayer life. What do you think? What do you do when temptation comes your way? I mean, maybe Jesus knows what he's talking about. He says, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And it says then in verse 41 of Luke 22, he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. He knelt down and he prayed. He said, Father, if it's your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And, and it says as a response of his prayer, it says an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. You know, I wonder, was the angel visible to Jesus? You know, what about you? What about when you pray? You know, is it possible that maybe angels come and strengthen you and you don't even know? I bet you there are. You know, when you pray, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel prayed, and there's a battle in heaven for 21 days. I believe the angelic host, I believe God moves at the sound of your voice. When you look at that impossible situation, that's where he specializes. And you begin to pray, and I bet you the angels will, will be right there to comfort you and strengthen you as well. And it says they strengthened him. And being in agony, what did Jesus do? He prayed more earnestly, and then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. I mentioned earlier Hebrews 5, verse 7, but it says that, you know, he offered up in the days of his flesh, offering up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his godly fear. And, you know, whether God hears your prayers, that's a whole new subject. We're not going there tonight. But if you're, you know, if you're living in humility and you're pressing in and seeking to be free from sin and you've got a godly fear of God in your heart, you know, a healthy reverence, I believe absolutely wholeheartedly God hears your prayers. There are some prayers according to Scripture that God doesn't hear. If you want to know what they are, search the Scriptures or talk to me later. Okay, I recommend the first one. And it says, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. But what do you do with your suffering? What are you doing with your suffering? I urge you to pray. Jesus, being in agony, prayed even more earnestly. And so then he goes back to his disciples and he finds them all sleeping from sorrow. And he says, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray. Pray. There's a time to pray, church. It's the hidden life. It can, make, it can seem lonely in prayer, but he's there. He's near to those that are of a broken heart and of a contrite spirit. He will not despise you in that place. And so it's one thing that the disciples learned from Jesus. They learned a lot of things, but prayer was one thing that they learned from him. And even after Jesus had ascended, what's the first thing they did? They entered into the place of prayer in the upper room. And it says they were there, and they're all in one accord with prayers and supplications with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and... And it's, you know, it's fascinating because from the place of prayer, decisions were made and the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church from the place of prayer. I believe that, you know, whether the question has been asked, what, what happens first? A revival, a move of God, or a prayer meeting? Prayer meeting. So who initiates the prayer meeting? God does or we do? I'm hearing both. I think both can apply. I believe, that God, I believe it's in the heart of God to always have revival, to always have a harvest, to always have renewal. You know, but there's certain times and seasons where things may happen where there's, you know, and, and I don't want to get into this too much, but I, I believe that we as human beings, understanding the heart of God, can press in and say, God, do it now. Do it now. And in the place of prayer, it's like God will come down because he's so moved by our prayers. But nonetheless, you know, it's from the place of prayer that, that the Holy Spirit came upon the whole church. And so, you're looking ahead to Acts chapter 6, again, in the, in the early church. It's like the number of disciples were multiplying, and uh, there was a complaint that began to rise against them because some of the widows weren't being fed. And so, what do they do? They summoned together their disciples, and they said, listen, it's not desirable for us to leave the place of prayer to wait on tables. Let's get people filled with the Holy Spirit that'll do it. And it says, we will devote ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And it says, the saying pleased the whole multitude. They knew something about prayer that I think many in the church today have lost sight of. That if you're in a position of leadership, and I don't care if that's leadership in a home, in the church, leadership in your home, leadership in your business, leadership over your property, 
If you got a dog or a cat, you got leadership over animals. Right? We want to exercise our authority in the place of prayer and begin to, to walk that out in that place. And so here they are. It was, it was pleasing because they understood in the early church the power of prayer. They knew that prayer would shift things. It would begin to change things around them. You know, we as Gentiles, I'm, I'm sure there's some Jewish people here, maybe Jewish blood. Anybody Jewish blood here? Some maybe? Anyway, God bless you. I think that's great. But we as the Gentiles received the gospel because of one man who prayed. Because Cornelius gave alms and he prayed. And it said for four, like he actually declared in Acts 10.30, four days ago I was fasting until this hour. At the ninth hour I prayed in my house. And then something happened and before you knew it, Peter was there in his house. Holy Spirit breaks in, the revelation comes. Of course the sheets had dropped earlier. You know, that gave him the understanding. But that was the start. A prayer meeting was the start of you and I having access into the kingdom of heaven, being able to be grafted into the vine, being able to receive the same message that the Jewish people had. It's glorious. And so, you know, it's, it's all about the importance of, of one man, even one man, a righteous man, praying and fasting, giving alms in his case. Now, let's look at this. I... There's a lot of people that, that um, I think have the question of why, why pray? You know, it's the whole thing of the sovereignty of God. And I'm really grateful to Miles Monroe. God bless him. He's with Jesus now. We lost him in a plane accident. I think it was last year. And uh, he really left a, a great mark. But Miles really inspired me in his book on prayer. And uh, he makes this statement. He says, or these, he says the following, there's no human activity more universal, yet none more mysterious and understood than prayer. Prayer has been found in every culture, civilization, and era. Primitive tribes in every count, continent worldwide have been known to practice prayer. To skeptics, prayer is a human invention designed as an outlet for the fears, frustrations, and anxiety of man. Nothing more than a psychological experience that eases the mind and helps to cope with life's challenges. Ever felt that way? Yet hundreds of millions around the world participate in prayer every day in every language, race, and culture. People of every religion pray as a requirement of their religion. Why? Why is the human spirit naturally drawn to seek solace and comfort in the unseen and the unknown? Is there a mystery that man still does not comprehend? Why should we and why do we pray? Some are discouraged because they've had the feeling that prayer is a fruitless ritual with no evidence of tangible results. Probably some here are suffering from a silent disillusionment with this ritual called prayer, and they've stopped doing it. Prayer is still the greatest common denominator among all the great biblical characters and thousands of believers throughout history. Moses, Abraham, David, Solomon, Esther, Deborah, Daniel, Joseph, all the prophets, Jesus Christ... And many of the apostles after that all had profound commitments to lives of prayer. We collectively could come up with many questions of prayer. Why is it necessary? How should we pray? Why pray to God in the name of Jesus? Why is prayer not always answered the way we expect? Why? When should we stop praying? What role does faith have in the prayer process? Do we have to qualify to prayer? If God is sovereign then, and can do whatever he wishes, then why pray? And does prayer affect or change destiny? Are you still with me? You're all there? You don't need to stand up and shake it? Okay. And here's the stuff that just, you know, it's like the lights went on. I read this. It's like, wow. It hit me. I hope it hits you in a great way in the same way. It says, to understand the principle of prayer, it's necessary to understand the mind and the purpose of the Creator Himself. Prayer is a result of God's established authority structure between heaven and earth. Prayer is also a product of his, faith, of his faithfulness to his word. Prayer is as simple as respecting God's authority. I'm coming to it yet. Because prayer was born out of God's arrangement for man's assignment on the earth. And it happened when the creator spoke two words during the creation process. Now, if you've got your Bibles, you might want to turn to Genesis 1.26. It's the dominion mandate. The dominion mandate, I believe, is repeated elsewhere in Scripture. But in this dominion mandate, maybe I should turn to it myself, it, uh, that's the place where it states that, you know, let, um, just a second here. Uh, it, it begins to declare that, uh, let every creeping thing, just a second, I should find it first before I try to say it. Genesis 1, 26. 
Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now you might look and say, are you sure that's the right verse? What does that have to do with prayer? Because there's two words written in there. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. What are the two words that radically shift our understanding? Let them. And I will explain that now. <laughs> because it, to me, is absolutely fascinating. God's mandate for man to have dominion over the earth or to dominate the earth was established in this declaration. By these words, God defined the boundaries of his right to legally influence and interfere in the earth's realm. It's noteworthy that God did not say, let us have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the livestock, and over all the earth and every creeping thing, but he says, let them. And so what God is saying is it is mankind's responsibility to take dominion over the earth realm. That means when there's problems on the earth, it's actually not God's problem. It's ours. Read Psalm 115.16. It says, now the heavens belong to the Lord your God, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. Now, I'm not finished yet. God didn't say let us, he said let them. What does this mean? It means that the legal authority to dominate the earth was given to mankind only. Number two, it means God the Father did not include himself in the legal authority structure over the earth. Are you with me? When he says let them... It means when you're about to mess up, he doesn't have a legal right to jump in there and stop you from doing what you're doing. Except, but we're going to get to that except later. Number three, it means when God says let them, it means that man has become the legal steward over the earth's dominion or over the earth's domain. Number four, it means any influence or interference from the supernatural realm on earth is only legal through mankind. Shall I repeat that? Any influence or interference from the supernatural realm on earth is only legal through mankind. Why is that? Because we're the legal stewards of the earth. God said, let them have dominion. Let them rule. There's an anointing for government residing inside of every human being that's on the face of the earth. Those that know Christ and those that don't yet know him. There's this thing within us that says we're called to rule. We're meant to have rulership and leadership within us. Unfortunately, when we have different ideologies, they begin to clash and confront one another and the world's a mess. Although there's a great and glorious light that's shining brightly. Hallelujah. Number five. God the Father himself, who is not a man, made himself subject to this law. Is that okay? When God says, let them, you know, he considers his word above his name. God is not a man that he should lie. If God meant to say, let us, he would have said, let us, but he said, let them. Are you with me? I'm going to rephrase that. I'm going to state it differently. The legal authority on earth is in the hands of humankind. The creator himself, because of his integrity, does not violate the law of his word. Nothing will happen in the earth realm without the active or pas passive permission of man, who is the legal authority on the earth. The creator and the heavenly beings cannot legally interfere in the earth realm without the cooperation or permission of mankind. And God must obtain the agreement and cooperation of a person for whatever he desires to do on the earth. Now, understanding that... Do you understand why we pray? Because we have been given the legal authority over the earth. The dominion mandate to take dominion over the earth was given to you and I. And it was also given to those that don't yet know Christ. But if we look around the world in the last 6,000 years, would you say the world's in a really good shape? Have we done a good job with the dominion mandate? 
Anybody think so? And so I believe the Father, being sovereign in all of his ways, looked ahead, looked upon the earth, knew that mankind without him would completely mess up. And by the way, I believe the heart of the Father, as was taught in the Lord's Prayer, is on earth as it is in heaven, which means that his intention is, is that the earth would look just like heaven. And he assigned the first Adam to ensure that that would happen. The first Adam committed treason against God, messed up, didn't happen. You and I have lived with a sin nature ever since, ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and have essentially messed up. So for that reason, God gave his one and only son, gave up his divinity, became a human being upon the planet, who paid a price, took the sin of the whole world, past, present, future, upon his own body, and he ascended to heaven where his sin was an acceptable sacrifice. And he's not going to stay in heaven forever, but he's going to come back again. And he's going to rule and reign on the earth. But he's the one that the Father has committed to being as the last Adam. The one that will be fully worthy and able to rule the whole earth. And will be fully able to do the very things that the Father had intended for the first Adam, but never happened. And so when you and I pray in the name of Jesus, we pray in the name of the one that the Father has chosen, the one who is worthy, the one who deserves your adoration, the one who is capable, the one who is deserving. And we pray in his name, the Father hears our prayers because he's never reneged on the dominion mandate at the beginning of all time. So that when we pray, God moves at the sound of her voice because he says, well, you as the earth's legal steward are inviting me into the situation. Therefore, I'm going to come in. Does that inspire any prayer lives here? I mean, it makes me want to pray. It makes me feel like when I pray, God's going to move. And I don't want to get discouraged if the answer didn't come when I wanted it to come. Because I know that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, even as the waters cover the sea. I've read the end of the book. Jesus is coming back. All dominion, all authority will be given to him. And he will rule and reign, and I, and I want to take my will, and I want to take everything within me and say, this is right, this is good. Jesus, you are worthy, you are holy, you are righteous. You have the capacity and the ability to turn it all around, and Jesus and his rulership and his governmental authority is going to do the exact same thing that you and I should do in our prayer lives. He's going to be talking to the Father, because he demonstrated that the first time that he came. And so he's going to govern the earth from the place of prayer, from the place of communication with his Father in heaven, and ultimately the earth will become just like it is in heaven because he's not going to ask us to pray something that isn't going to happen. Isn't that great? And so when it comes to prayer, it's like God inspire us to prayer because we have this dominion mandate, and we still have it. And so the apostles know this, they knew this, and they began to declare the apostolic prayers. You know, I'm not going to go over them all, but, you know, there's a whole bunch of them. I love Colossians 1.9. For this reason also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. I mean, what a prayer. What if you even start by praying that? Isn't it glorious? Absolutely awesome. So there's a whole bunch more that are in there. I'm not going to get into it, but you can see this whole reality right through and through. Look at Moses with the plagues. Have you ever noticed the story of Moses? And I'm going to wrap up here. You know, the story of Moses is that Moses was sent after a lot of, you know, a lot of digging deep, a lot of uh, character development, and suddenly the Lord sends him to Pharaoh, and he says, I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go, that they may worship me. And so, you know, Moses brings it across and says, listen, let, God says, let my people go. And so we begin to see a pattern come forth regarding, especially regarding the plagues of frogs, insects, hail, locusts. More, Moses ends up, you know, essentially threatening, saying, listen, Pharaoh, let my people go, or else something bad's going to happen. And Pharaoh ignores it, or he makes a promise, and then he reneges on it. And then the plague arrives, and then Pharaoh begs for relief, and then he asks Moses to have them removed. So what does Moses do? He prays, and the plagues are removed, and God removes them. And so why is this necessary? Because Moses was God's appointed steward on the earth to release the dominion. 
And I think it's a sign for even you and I as the sons of God. When we see a plague coming, we pray. And God will answer our prayers just like he did for Moses. It's Psalm 91. Right? It will not come near your dwelling place. A thousand shall fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand. It will not come near you. And, and besides, the father wants righteous connection with, you know, his righteous sons and daughters. But, you know, there's certain things that will only happen through prayer. If I could have our worship team up again, Bill, please. But Romans 16, verse 20, is a verse that I'm fascinated by. I think this is incredible. I just kind of came upon it. It just gripped my heart more. I mean, I've read it before, but I never thought about it much. But it says this, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Now, how is the God of peace going to crush Satan under your feet? He's already there. There's the legal position and the living condition. He's there legally. But his living position, he's still on the earth. He's not cast into the lake of fire yet. So how will the God of Satan... Sorry, the God... <laughs> let me rephrase that. Erase that from the tape. <laughs> Satan is his own God. How will the God, the God of peace... I'm glad you're paying attention. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. It's a fulfillment of Genesis chapter 3. It's going to come through prayer. You and I are going to stand understanding that we have a dominion mandate according to Genesis 1.26, repeated throughout scriptures, including Matthew 28.18-20, to 20, and different other places reworded. And we're going to begin to understand who we are as sons and daughters. And the Lord has chosen not to defeat Satan himself, although he did that on the cross 2,000 years ago, but God, as in God is the divine God who could have done away with him just like that. Even in Revelation 12, it's not God that fights Satan. It's, a, it's an angel. It's another created being. It's Lucifer. It's Lucifer that's cast down by Michael the archangel in Revelation 12. Once he gets cast out of the second heaven, he lands in the first heaven. And then who's going to do him away? It's going to be human beings. It's going to be you and I, sons and daughters, the righteous ones that carry dominion mandate, that know our authority, that know our anointing. And then we will crush Satan beneath our feet. And then the end game is, is that he gets cast into the lake of fire, as indicated in Revelation 20 at that point in time. But let me tell you, it's not going to happen with a prayerless church. It's not going to happen if you and I don't learn to pray now. If we don't learn to be proactive with the spare time you've got, if you don't have a vision for your future, I've just painted a little one. Okay, I, I hope you have a lot more vision than what I've just said. But I urge you, the next time you're tempted to grab the remote control and watch a mindless movie, and why don't you grab the Word of God instead and start praying? Why don't you dig, get up on your, get out on your knees and get into your prayer closet and start to call on the name of Jesus for those things that you're called to have dominion over? Because it's the little much principle. It's when you, when you gain authority and victory over those things that plague you in the, in the small areas, then he's going to give you more. And when we learn how to pray as the church and we learn our authority and begin to release it, I tell you, it's going to be great and glorious. So how many people of prayer do we have here? How many people want to pray more than 15 minutes a day? How about like 30? You know, and, and by the way, start at one. Don't expect yourself to go from zero to 60 in 10 seconds. Okay, start small. Take baby steps. Don't let the enemy take you out by saying, well, I tried it and it doesn't work. Make little decisions. If you live a prayerless life, and by the way, there's statistics out there that say there's, I don't know, majority of pastors that pray less than an hour a week. God help us. You know, it's just horrible, but it's just we've lost sight of it. We've become disillusioned. I mean, even in Acts 6, remember, you know, it's like we can give ourselves to serving, but we need to be focused on, on the, the reading, the ministry of the Word and prayer. All of us do. You know, make a point in that. You, whatever your disposable time frame is, establish yourself in the Word of God. I remember Garth Jesley, who was an executive. Garth's in our church. He's not here today. 
But I remember Garth told me years ago, and it wasn't because he was boasting. He said, yeah, I get up at 4.30 every morning, you know, so I can have a few hours with the Lord before I hop in my car and go downtown to Bay Street. I tell you, you know, you just go to bed a little earlier if you need to. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He's going to develop things inside your heart that will establish you. And when you begin to understand who you are and that your prayers move the heart of God, you're going to shift things and the kingdom of God will advance and the enemy is going to tremble. I, I want to see the enemy tremble a little bit more, you know? He's going to turn tail and run. So why don't we stand? And I want to invite, in just a moment, our ministry team to, uh, to pray with people, specifically on disillusionment, you know, when it comes to prayer. But to start with, I want to say that life in Christ is the most victorious life you can ever imagine. I don't know who is here tonight. Maybe you're listening and watching on, online, you know, on, on live stream. If you don't know Jesus Christ as the one who's forgiven your sins, as the one who deeply desires you and wants a love relationship with you, you can have that, that knowledge tonight. You can have that relationship tonight where you know him, where you walk with him, where you, you have the peace of God in your heart that you're not, you're not condemned, you're not throttled by condemnation, guilt, and shame any longer. You know, I, I, I'm talking to somebody. I know I am. We're, how many of you have been throttled and you feel like you just need to be restored to a relationship with Jesus? Maybe you've known him once and you've walked away and you know that this is the hour, this is the day to come back again. I want to ask you in just a moment to put your hands up. Maybe you've never ever given your life to him or your heart to him. Today is the day of salvation. I tell you, today's the first day of the rest of your life. There can be a complete 180 degree turn that takes place, you know, this day where tomorrow doesn't need to be like yesterday. Next week doesn't need to be like last week. There can be a shift and a change. And so I'm going to pray a prayer with you and invite you all to come and pray it with me and say, Father in heaven, just repeat after me, Father in heaven, I confess my sin. I confess that I've turned back from you. And I've become disillusioned. And I've lost hope. But I come to you now because of your son, Jesus Christ. I believe you died for me, Jesus. I believe that I've sinned and I've fallen short of your glory. Come into my heart and life. Wash me clean. Refresh me. Renew me and cleanse me. I want to be filled with your Holy Spirit. Fill me now. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. And you know, if there's anybody here that's prayed that for the first time tonight, I'm going to invite you to put your hand up. Is there anybody that's never ever prayed anything similar to that? You've never committed your heart and life to Him? Just raise your hands. Is there anybody here that feels like you know, you've, you've prayed it before, but you've just fallen away, and you know you need to restore that commitment. You need to restore your walk with Him. I want to welcome you to raise your hand if that's you. Is there anybody here? And again, it might not be anybody in this room. If there's nobody here, I assume you're all followers of Jesus, because the truth is it's a no-brainer. Really, it is a no-brainer. It's the greatest gift ever given to mankind. But maybe for those of you that are watching online, if that's you... I would urge you to get connected with a life-giving church. If you send us an email at mail, dot, mail at catchthefire.com and let us know your name, your information, where you live, we'll try to get you connected to a, a life-giving church where you're able to receive some friendship and some help in your faith in Jesus. It's the best day of the rest of your life. I'm not saying that there's going to be rosy times you know, ahead that everything's going to be a rose garden, but I'm telling you, there's going to be a lot of rosy days, and you're going to find the strength of a companion that washes you of all guilt and shame and condemnation, and so it's glorious. And so on that note, I want to uh, give an opportunity for our ministry team, and even, Michael, if you could have everybody, let's say, line up on the side. We want to be able to pray. Yeah, we want to pray for everybody there on the side. If you feel like you've just become disillusioned in the place of prayer, if you've got a sense that you need to renew your, your prayer life. You need to confess your sin, as it were. 
you know, confess the sin of a prayerless life, that you've lost that spirit of prayer, you've lost the burning, perhaps you've lost just a sense of, does prayer really matter? Maybe some of those other things that I mentioned earlier gripped your heart and life where you feel that, you know, you've just lost touch because you don't even think it matters. You're among many in the masses that, that think you're just wasting your time. You're part of a, a, mean, a needless ritual. I, I would urge you to go to the side where Michael, yeah, and uh, where they will come and pray for you. I also want to say that if, you know, if you don't feel like that qualifies to you, you feel like you got a vibrant prayer life, you want to go more, I want to go more. You know, we can always get, you know, deeper into that, make it a higher priority in our lives. Um, but you are able to help us catching. We want to be able to have catchers, just not because people have to fall over, but, you know, because you can, people receiving prayer can be in a place of rest where they can receive prayer and feel like, you know, if God comes and moves, they're able to just help you down gently and uh, minister to you on the floor. You know, we'd love to have some catchers. So is there anybody here that's able to help us catch? Just join yourself to ministry team. Ministry team, if you could raise your hands, please. And these guys will be all there. And, you know, just go and line up with them. If there's anybody else that wants prayer for a different matter, if you could just make your way to the front and uh, we'd be happy to pray for you here uh, just as we continue to worship the Lord. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom, give you his peace. You know, may you know his heart. And so if you've got to go, God bless you. This Friday night, may you be filled with the spirit of prayer, the spirit of praise. And if you want prayer ministry pertaining to prayer, they're right there at the side. If it's something different, you know, that you just would love to have prayer for, make your way to the front. And if ministry team needs to, they can come up here as well. So God bless you. Over to you, Bill. Show me.